I have often said that the Psalms are unique in Scripture in so many ways. They are not the product of the study or of a well thought out theological dissertation. The Psalms are really the heart cry of men who have been passing through certain acute spiritual experiences and they are writing out of these experiences to testify to us how the Lord has dealt with their souls and how he has blessed them and been to them the God in whom they exalt and whose name the Psalms praise so freely. In that sense, the text for the whole of the Psalter is in Psalm 66 and verse 16 where the psalmist says, Come and hear all ye that fear God, and I will declare what he has done for my soul. Now that is what the psalmist is doing wherever you turn in the Psalms. He is declaring what the Lord has done for his soul. And he is doing so in order that you and I who have dealings with the same God might discover the same grace and blessing the psalmist has discovered. Now you may have noticed that Psalm 3 is special for a number of reasons. It is the first psalm which has a title and the title gives us a little of the tragic background of this prayer because the background of Psalm 3 is a great tragedy you will notice the title is a Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son and you get the story in the second book of Samuel and chapter 15 where you remember we have the account of how Absalom David's son raised a rebellion against David his father and stole the hearts of the men of Israel after him so that it seemed as if the whole of Israel had deserted David and had gone after Absalom. And he experienced that most bitter of all anguish, treachery within his own house and within his own family. And David therefore became a fugitive in his own kingdom. There is a poignant picture of David in 2 Samuel 15.30 where he is going up the ascent to the Mount of Olives weeping as he went barefoot and with his head covered and all the people who were with him covered their heads and they went up weeping as they went and they wept for David because he was a man whose life had been smashed and whose heart had been broken and whose future appeared to have been robbed from him and the glory appeared to have departed from David and the people wept and it may have been at such a moment that the words of this psalm were not written so much as wrung out of David's heart his distress was many-sided, of course. We were singing in the last verse of that hymn about how God can come to the soul's abyss. And David's soul was in the abyss at this moment. And his distress came, for example, from physical factors. It was physical distress because he was in physical danger and in physical discomfort as he lived out on the hills with an increasing company defecting to Absalom daily. And it's of that that he cries in the first verse, O Lord, how many are my foes. He was discovering the physical danger which was so much part of his life at this period. His distress was emotional too, of course, because he was facing the reality of a family tragedy. And he had the anguish of discovering his own son Absalom turning against him. 
He was in an insecure kingdom, but I reckon the last place that David expected this insecurity to breach was in his own family circle. And the emotional stress was going to grow. And God only knows what that emotional stress was like when a family began to break up like this and the news went round Israel that Absalom had turned traitor inside his father's house. And when the time came that Absalom, his son, was not only a traitor to his father, but a victim of his father's soldiers and had fallen in the battle, and the messenger came back and David said, Is it well? And they told him, Absalom is dead. And the sobs of David went round Israel as he cried, O Absalom, my son, my son Absalom, would God that I had died for thee. David's distress was emotional distress. But I have no doubt that his deepest distress was neither physical nor emotional but spiritual. For the deepest wounds in David's spirit arose not from his circumstances, but from his conscience. I have no doubt that the words of Nathan the prophet who had come to him in 2 Samuel chapter 12, in the aftermath of his sin with Bathsheba, were beating in David's bosom even at this point and hammering in his mind as he woke every morning and spent sleepless nights. For Nathan the prophet had come to him and said, In that darkest hour, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house. The sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me. And that is why the comments of the many in verse 2 of the psalm cut to the quick of David's heart. Many are saying of me, O Lord, there is no help for him in God. David wept openly, not just because he was cast down before men, but because he feared that he was cast off by God. Many are saying of me, there is no help for him in God. Now, what I want to ask this evening is this. How did David find rest in such distress of soul as this? Few men have known what it is to go through such anguish as this. And how did David find that God led him out of this so that at the end of the psalm he is glorying in the deliverance of God and the blessing that there is upon his people? When this poor man cried, how did the Lord help him? Well, I want to suggest to you that the key to it is in verse 3. And it is the key to every distress and anguish over circumstances and conscience and sin and failure. In some ancient versions of the Psalter, Psalm 3 has a heading or a title as some of the old printers used to give titles to the Psalms, and this one has a title which is really borrowed from a Puritan book. And the title is, A Lifting Up for the Downcast. And that's exactly what God did for David. You will notice in verse 3 there are three ways in which he has learned to speak of God. Thou, O Lord, art a shield about me. The second is, Thou art my glory. And the third, 
Thou art the lifter up of my head. Now the third of these is the one that I want to focus upon at the moment because I think it's one of the most beautiful names for God in the whole of the Bible. Have you ever thought of the Lord in these terms? He is the lifter up of my head, says David. Now you can see the picture, can you, which it paints. When someone is downcast, what is it that you see even in their outward posture? Their shoulders go down dejected and discouraged and their head goes forward. It's the classic picture of hopelessness and despair when a man's head is down, when his shoulders slouch. And there is something that gives you the impression that he is almost physically given up. It's the picture that you get again and again in the Bible of the man who is cast down. Now this is what it means. And David found God to be the lifter up of his head. And I want to point out to you that God seeks to lift the psalmist's head, thou art my shield, my glory, and the lifter up of my head. He does it for a very special reason. What happens, have you ever thought, when your head is cast down? Well, of course, when you are like that, what is happening is that your eyes are turned in upon yourself. Have you noticed that? You are looking in all the wrong directions. Your eyes are cast down upon your own heart, upon your own sin, upon your own failure, your weakness and your despair, your feelings. And what God wants to do is to come to David in the abyss of this despair and as it were put his hand under his chin and lift the man's head up and turn the whole focus of his attention away from himself away from his failure, away from all the darkness that he sees there. And to bring him to the place where he will say, But thou, O Lord, do you see how verse 3 begins? But thou, O Lord, many are saying of me, But thou, O Lord, thou art a shield, thou art my glory, thou art the lifter up of my head. And by the end of the psalm, the Lord has done something for this man that makes him walk through the world bearing a different kind of posture. And beloved, it is a glorious thing and a most realistic thing to see God do this in the lives of his children. You see, David has already faced all the truth about himself and about his sin in Psalm 51 which although numerically after Psalm 3 is historically before it, as you will know. Psalm 51 is the psalm where David pours out his heart to God, crying against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Wash me, purge me like his pieces. And he cries out to God about the foulness of his own heart. But now God comes to him, having faced all the horror of his sin and what it has done. God comes to him and puts his hand under his chin and says to him, My poor dejected child, there is not the faintest hope of your getting out of this abyss of despair so long as your eyes are still fixed there, he says. Let me lift up your head and show you where deliverance lies. And that's what he did for David. And what I want us to do this evening is to ask of the psalm, what was it in God that David's eyes were open to see which lifted up his head and became the transformation of his life. Well, it could all be summed up in one word. And the one word is grace. 
It was God's grace that David found when his head was lifted up to see all that there was in God. And Peter speaks in 1 Peter 4 of the manifold grace of God, the many splendored, many sided grace of God. And there are several facets of it which David discovered, which I want us simply to look at this evening in this psalm. Let me show them to you before we look at them in a little more detail. The first is in verse 3. Thou, O Lord, art a shield about me. And that's saving grace. The second is in the second half of verse 3. Thou art my glory. That is glory in the place of shame and dishonor. And that's restoring grace. The third is in verses 4 and 5. I cried aloud to the Lord and he answers me from his holy hill. I lie down and sleep. I wake again for the Lord sustains me. And that's sustaining grace. And the fourth is in verses 7 and 8. Arise, O Lord, deliver me, for thou dost smite all my enemies on the cheek. Thou dost break the teeth of the wicked. Deliverance belongs to the Lord. And that's delivering or redeeming grace. And I want us to look at the psalmist's discovery of the manifold grace of God in this psalm. Although not in that order, but these four things. First of all, the Lord is a shield or saving grace. It's what God lifted his head up so that he would see. But thou, O Lord, art a shield about me. Now a shield is required by someone who is under attack from an enemy. And David was being besieged by enemies. But whenever a man is under this kind of pressure that David was under, this sinister pressure, which was producing in him a tendency towards despair and distress, the first thing that you need to do is to identify who the enemy is ultimately. For instance, whose voice do you think that was that kept saying to him in verse 2, There is no help for you in God. Many are saying of me, There is no help for him in God. Oh, it was the voice of the many. It was the voice of his enemies, of those who were just waiting to see some collapse in David's life. But ultimately, I have no question where that accent came from. It was the voice of the arch accuser. You can recognize his tone. You see what he was saying. Now, this is the real nature of the psalmist's distress. He was saying to David, God has finished with you, he says. There is nothing more that God has to say to you. There is nothing more that he can do with you. God has washed his hands of you. You've gone too far this time, Satan was saying to David. And for this kind of thing, and for a man like you, there is no forgiveness. He says, there is no help for him in God. And what he was seeking to do, you see, was to precipitate David into a place of utter despair. Now, my dear friends, if you know anything about Christian living and about Christian warfare, about the realities of Christian discipleship, you will know that this is precisely what the evil one seeks to do when he begins to assault you and bring you under pressure. It's an extraordinary thing how totally perverse the devil is with respect to our sin. Can you imagine how he said to David when he was there tempted with Bathsheba, and the devil doubtless came to him at that point and said, Go on, go down and have her. 
There'll be no great harm in that kind of thing. That's the insinuation that he was putting into his mind when he saw Bathsheba and desired her. Go on, he would say. After all, everybody's doing that kind of thing nowadays. It's fairly common. It's amazing how many people are drawn by one of the devil's devices. Everybody's doing it. They're even doing it in Christian circles. You know? And David is drawn on and the devil says to him, it will be quite a minor thing really. But then when the full agony of what had happened to him through his sin was breaking in upon him and David sat in tears and ashes, the devil came with another accent, as he always does. And he says, you know, for a thing like that there really is no forgiveness. You've gone too far this time. You've been an utter fool. And even God can do nothing with someone like you. Now, my dear friends, the subtlety of it is that we believe him both times. Isn't that true? We believe him both times. We believe him in his enticements. And we believe him when he comes as the accuser of the brethren to accuse us and bring us into despair before God. And he says, God is finished with you. Nothing he can do. They said of me, there is no help for him in God. Uh, one of the great principles that I seek by God's grace to adhere to is never to divulge pastoral confidences. But I can tell you this evening that I have lost count of the people who have come speaking in precisely that language to me and saying, I know that there is nothing even God can do for me now. Now, how do you meet this kind of assault? Well, do you notice David found the answer to it in the Lord as his shield. This was saving grace. God brings him to meet the devil's lies about God with the truth about God. And you will notice that it's not simply that the Lord provides a shield for David and says to him, Now, here is a shield. He is the shield to him. It is that David has to go and hide in God. He is to say the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and is safe. And when the evil one comes with all his accusations, David is to cry out to him, it is not in me that is in my flesh that I have any confidence. I have no hope in David. All that belongs to David is hopeless and condemned. But my hope is in God. And he has lifted up my head to see saving grace there. Oh, beloved, that's the saving grace that lifts God's children out of their despair. That they are to take their stand not on any shifting sand of our own goodness or achievement. We are to say to the evil one, all that you say of me is true. But my confidence is not in me. I hide me, Jesus, in thy name. On Christ the solid rock I stand. Is that where you're standing this evening? Is that where your life is built this evening? Is that what you have done about your sin, beloved, this evening? Are you standing on the rock which is Christ? Are you trusting in saving grace? Have you found it in Jesus Christ? And oh, in the midst of all the battles and pressures of Christian living, is it saving grace that is your theme? From the beginning of your Christian life to the glorification, this is where you will find rest. Thou, O oh Lord, art a shield to me. Do you know that beautiful hymn? 
which they have so sadly cut out of the third edition of the church hymnary, like so many of the other good hymns, Not what I am, O Lord, but what Thou art, that, that alone will give my soul true rest. Thy love, not mine, bids fears and doubts depart. Not what I am, but what Thou art. Saving grace makes us take the Lord as our shield. But God found, David found in God not only saving grace, but sustaining grace. And you notice how in verses 4 and 5 he testifies to God's sustaining grace in one great principle. He found sustaining grace from the faithfulness of God. Look at verse 4. I cry aloud to the Lord and he answers me from his holy hill. Now if I may trouble and burden you with grammar for just a little, I'm not really greatly interested in Hebrew grammar except it helps us for Christian living. But the grammar here is an imperfect tense. And literally translated, verse 4 should read, I keep on crying aloud to the Lord, and He keeps on answering me from His holy hill, or I am in the habit of crying to the Lord, and the Lord is in the habit of answering me from His holy hill. What's David saying? He says, I have proved God. Thou, Lord, he says, thou art a shield about me. Thou art the lifter up of my head. And I have proved the Lord. I have proved him as the answerer of prayer. I have proved him as the faithful God who never forgets a syllable of his promises. And he is faithful now. What David needed in this moment was that kind of assurance. He was the victim of treachery. He had found that he couldn't even put his trust within his own family circle. Ah, but he says, the Lord has lifted up my head. And I have found sustaining grace in the faithfulness of God. Now, my dear friends, that's the use of the past and of past experience for the believer, as the psalmist illustrates to us. The use of the past is not to live in it, as the good old days, you know, and we wish they were back again. The good old days were perhaps not so good as we sometimes think they were. And in any case, we are not called to live in them. We are called to live in 1978. And the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ is not the great I was. He is the great I am. And the God with whom we have to do is a God whose faithfulness we have proved in the past and as a reality today. That's the glorious thing about being here in 1978. There is nothing so contemporary as all that God is to his children. And David says, I have proved him. He has never failed me. He has never failed to answer prayer. I have been in the habit of asking and he has been in the habit of hearing and I may trust him now out here in the wilderness pursued by my son's army. I may trust him to hear me. I cannot trust the devil. I cannot trust myself. I dare not put trust in princes. But I can trust the Lord. And so he says, I lie down and sleep. Verse 5, I lie down and sleep. And the faithfulness of God is his pillow. Now there is a pillow to rest your head on in the midst of distress and anguish of soul. The pillow 
on which to lay your head is God's absolute faithfulness. The universe from before the beginning of time has never seen a breach in that. Our God is faithful. And so David says, I slept and I woke because the Lord sustains me. I lie down and sleep, verse 5. I wake again for the Lord sustains me. One of the old Puritans speaks of improving the wakening hour. Have you ever heard of that pamphlet? Improving the wakening hour. Do you see what he means? He means that when you rise in the morning, when you waken at the beginning of the new day, that's a very means of grace because you say, here is the faithfulness of God. I lie down and sleep. I wake again for the Lord has sustained me and the grace of God has kept me in this night. I am a testimony, he is saying, to the fact that he that keepeth Israel neither slumbers nor sleeps. He keeps his people. Sustaining grace. I once heard one of the greatest Irishmen I have ever known, Johnny Cochran. I wonder if some of you from Ireland knew Johnny Cochran. He was a great evangelist in Dublin. I have met so many people who were led to Christ through Johnny Cochran. I have lost count of them. And he had a most amazing, bubbling sense of humor, even for an Irishman. And I remember him once at a conference at which I was attending, speaking on this fifth verse of Psalm 3, and just on the fifth verse, and he was speaking on the goodness and faithfulness of God. And he said, you know, David could get up in the morning and say how good the Lord has been to me. I have lain down and slept. I have wakened because the Lord has sustained me. And I've never known what it is yet to wake up and find I've been murdered. <laughs> now, you know, that's what the psalmist was saying. The morning light brought him another testimony that his God was a faithful God, that he who saved also sustained. But here's the third thing. He discovered not only saving grace and sustaining grace, but delivering grace in God. For what David finds is that the grace of God is sufficient not only to save him from the attacks of the enemy, and to sustain him in the midst of all his dangers and pressures, but to deliver them out of their hands and to break their power in verse 7. Arise, O Lord, deliver me, for thou dost smite all my enemies on the cheek. Thou dost break the teeth of the wicked. Now that's the figure of speech for breaking their power, for disabling them. Thou dost break the teeth of the wicked. How do you see the point of what the psalmist is saying? It is not just survival that David is interested in. It's victory that he's interested in. He does not just want to survive the pressures and get through and at the end say, phew, that was difficult. He wants to come to the end knowing that his God is not only able to save and to sustain, but to deliver him out of the powers of darkness that have, have, have surrounded him. And in God he finds this. He finds that the very victory which he seeks, God has gained for him. It is delivering, redeeming, victorious grace that has touched his life as the Lord lifted up his head. And God has gained this victory to give it to his people. Now, beloved, that has come to a fullness in Christ in a way that David could scarcely have known except in shadow. Because great David's greater son has come into this very battleground and he has gained the decisive victory. He has put to flight the powers of darkness and broken the teeth, not just of the ungodly, 
but of the prince of darkness himself. He arose, we sing. He arose with a mighty triumph for his foes. The Lord Christ is risen, the tempter is foiled, our great foe is baffled. His strongholds are spoiled. When we are brought into the realm of grace, we are brought into the realm of victory, and our Lord Jesus Christ has gained that victory, not for himself, but to give it to us. Thanks be to God who giveth us the victory. And that's what we are to have our eyes upon. This is what put backbone into this frightened man as he was hounded over the hills of Judea. And God put fiber into his being and sent him out confident into the world saying, Arise, O Lord, deliver me, O my God, thou dost smite all my enemies. My dear friends, I was saying the other Wednesday evening when we were studying Ephesians 6, it is important for us to be conscious of the wiles of the devil. It is important for us not to be ignorant of his devices, but it is vital for us in Christian living to be more God-conscious than Satan-conscious. It is vital for us to have grasped what our Lord Jesus has done in his mighty triumph. And to know that we do stand on the victory side and that it is only a matter of time we are involved in the mopping up operation now. It's only a matter of time until all his foes become his footstool. Oh, what a glorious inheritance it is to live in such a family and such a kingdom as this. And that's what the Lord's people need to grasp when they are tempted to despair. Tempted to despair of themselves, to despair of the church, to despair of the circumstances in which they are. They are to say, Arise, O Lord, for thou dost smite all mine enemies. Deliverance belongs to the Lord and thy blessing to thy people. But there is even more, and I finish with this. There is saving grace, and there is sustaining grace here, and there is redeeming or delivering grace. But there is also something very wonderful at the heart of this psalm, and that is restoring grace. In verse 3, the psalmist says, Thou, O Lord, art a shield about me, my glory and the lifter up of my head. Now David's glory had gone, you see. There were days of great glory in the past for David. There were days when he knew the anointing of God upon him as the king. There were days when he knew the hand of the Lord upon him as his servant. There were days when he had been exalted in worship and praise, and some of these psalms are the evidence of it. But it seemed as if, like Israel itself, there was written over him, the glory has departed. Let me read to you some words that were written of this psalm. Out on the hills, David's heavy heart must often have asked, What future is there for me now? My glory has been turned into shame. But God had called him to be a king, a king who would reflect the glory of the king of kings. And having brought him to see and feel his shame, he now sets about restoring his glory. 
And the last view we have of David in 2 Samuel at this period of his life is of God not just saving the man out of his distresses and sustaining him through his dangers and redeeming him out of his enemy's clutches, but of leading him back by the hand to the glory that he thought was now in the past, leading him back to Jerusalem, and there is the figure of David now with his head lifted up and going back to the throne and to the kingdom and to the authority that he had known before from God. And he heard the voice of God saying to him, I will restore unto you the years that the locusts have eaten. Thou art my glory and the lifter up of my head. And maybe David was thinking about that when he spoke of the Lord as the one who restoreth my soul. My dear friends, that is the God who has come to us in Jesus Christ. And I wonder if he has come to you and brought you here this evening so that he might draw you thus to himself and bring you his saving grace and draw you to Jesus that you might hide in him to bring you his sustaining, redeeming grace but perhaps above all to bring you his restoring grace. You can get back, he was saying to David. There is a way back. May God in his grace put his hand beneath our chin as it were and lift up our head and take us back to the kingdom. Let us pray. Our blessed Lord, we open our hearts to thee this evening. Pray that thou wilt come and speak thy word deeply into our hearts and grant that we may find its transforming grace at work within us for the praise of thy great name and through Jesus Christ we ask it. Amen.